Good morning and uh, thanks for getting up so early. Um, my name is Jeff Houston, I'm with APNIC. This morning is certainly not a technical talk, it's more a talk about the industry that you and I live in and work in and play in. And these are some, I think, personal perspectives about what I've experienced over the last 15 or so years, firstly in the academic and research sector and then serving my time for 10 years in a carrier world. In looking around, it certainly appears, at least physically, that most of you are more than five years old, which is good. Most of you would have lived through some part of the 20th century. And what a century it's been. Phenomenal social changes. And one of the most compelling and relevant here was the rise of the communications industry. From the antecedents of the exposition of 1876 in Philadelphia with the telephone, the communications industry in the 20th century became a massive behemoth. It carried trillions of dollars of investment, long-term investment, and it serviced the world. It was a phenomenal industry. In the 1980s, in its heyday, even in a country as small as Australia, with at the time 18 million people, over 100,000 of them worked for the telephone company. In Britain, more than 400,000 worked for the telephone company. And in this country, in its heyday, my guess is more than one and a half million Americans worked for the telephone company. It was big. It was huge. It was massive. And in the 1980s, in its heyday, the seeds of its destruction were already being sown. And when that destruction became overt, when the cannibalism of the telephone industry by the data industry started to appear inside the industry itself in the late 1990s, the feeding frenzy was amazing. What a boom it was. This was a boom, of course, that we've seen time and time again. Boom and bust is not unusual. If you look back, 1637, all of a sudden, somewhere in Europe, people started moving goods out of the Rhine River Valley. And the folk who managed to sit on the intersection of the Rhine River and the North Sea decided that they'd tax everything that moved. The amount of money that flowed into Holland was astronomical. What did they do with it? Well, after they'd built their fine townhouses and everything else, they turned to conspicuous consumption. And the one place they looked, weirdly enough, was tulip bulbs. In 1637, you could buy three bulbs of a tulip called Sempra Augusta, and you'd pay the same amount of money as a neat little townhouse in downtown Amsterdam. That was a boom. That was an amazing boom in tulip bulbs. The crash was, of course, astronomical. It took decades to overcome. They finally got over it, but what a boom it was. We never learn. About a century later, a Scotsman, bankrupt by the time, at that time, wandered into the French court, who was at the time building the Versailles Palace and had a little bit of a cash flow problem. Aha, he said, I have the answer. It's called paper. What we'll do is we'll con the entire French aristocracy to exchange their gold for these pieces of paper. Cool idea. Furthermore, let's set up a bank to do this. Even cooler. Let's issue shares in the bank. Wow. All of a sudden, the word millionaire invented came into the French vocabulary because the share price skyrocketed. The boom lasted for a year. The subsequent crash was amazing. Three people lost their lives in queuing for the bank to try and get their money back. It seeded, I think, the French Revolution some 60 years later. So boom and bust is amazing. Even in another century later in Great Britain, the railway boom took over, and the subsequent euphoria over the next five years was accompanied by a phenomenal crash thereafter. That didn't mean the death of railways, by the way. But boom and bust is nothing new. And what a boom it was for us. It was terrific. It was just as euphoric, just as creative, because the feeding frenzy was a feeding frenzy on an industry that was worth trillions. And it was visibly not in touch with the world anymore. 
So all of a sudden, we were there. And what a boom it was. If you went to the IETF in 1989, there you were as nerds in paradise. You were rebuilding that world. And we felt really good about it. Absolutely anything was possible. I don't know if you remember this T-shirt. This was TGV. Simon was an Australian called Simon Hackett who managed to hack into his remote control system and do the entire system across the internet playing radio. It was a wonderful time. If you can't read that, it says, in a display of perverse brilliance, Simon the repairman mistakes a compact disc player for a workstation system unit, but manages to connect it to the network anyway. And of course, we even had internet toasters, as some of you might remember, John Romke doing an interop, burning the toast time and time again over the internet. And of course, we had arrogance. We had deserved arrogance. Anything was possible, and the old ways simply weren't there. Again, another T-shirt. This is the ATM one, misapplying tomorrow's technology today. Some of you, I hope, still have it. It's one of my treasured ones, too. Happy little packets enter the shredder, and broken bits emerge out of it. But the spectre of the bust was always there. And Nanog, I suppose, was one of the more prescient of these, that even before the boom really took hold, the bust was coming. If any of you went to Ann Arbor in 1996, and I didn't, but I did manage to get the T-shirt, thank you, Bill, the spectre was looming. Daddy Big Bucks was there. What sort of a boom was it? Actually, oddly enough, despite the euphoria, it wasn't that big a boom. If you look at Yahoo's index of the NASDAQ over that period, the boom prices were only approximately three times higher than their longer term value, compared to other booms in other industries which got up to 100, 200, 300 times their base value. This was a relatively minor boom. But of course, things have changed. It's a post dot com boom and bust world at this point, but the lessons are no different. The boom may have come, the bust may have happened, the panic, disillusion and depression may have happened, the overreaction may have happened, but there is still an underlying industry there. But what I want to put to you today is that the underlying industry is not the same as the industry a lot of the players think they're working in. There is a fundamental misunderstanding between the true dynamics and what happens in my workplace and your workplace, particularly if you work in the carrier industry. The myths are now prevalent and are driving it. There's no doubt that things have changed. The idea that you could come into a company as a geek and go, well, you know, what we really need to do is this, that and the other. Wow, let's get some venture capital. Let's raise the money. Let's make it happen. Let's take over the world. Our share price will go into astronomical heights. Is no longer the operating mode in the ISP industry. The plumbing industry is now more akin to sewerage than it is to high value add. We're now talking, if you go to any of our meetings, and you go to them just as much as I do, service consolidation, dependability, integrity, trying to make sure that the system always works, that the network is not a gamble, the network is not flaky, things work for consumers. As you heard yesterday, if some any consumer rings up your help desk, you have blown the revenue from that consumer for the year. If they take more than half an hour, you have blown the revenue from that consumer for the lifetime of their use of your service. Unless your service works out of the box, reliably, predictably, and unless people can use it without having to talk to your staff, you're losing. So now what we talk about is all about services that plug and play reliably, and reliable is the key word, services that are dependable, Services that work every time the same way. Oddly enough, it's the same mantra the telephone system used 20 years ago. We're no different. We are that industry. So now we're doing the same thing as they did. We're looking for value-added service models. We're talking all about quality and performance. We're doing next-generation networks with integrated QoS. We're doing performance-based networks that reliably do content-based routing. We're trying to add value into the packet. Will this work? Now, applications and services have business cases with them. That's the industry we're now working in. It's not the industry it used to be. We're now back to a very, very conservative view. Optimism alone is no substitute for knowledge and capability. 
You have to understand the business you're in. So the business we're in now is not wild-eyed rapid expansionism, not in the ISP sewerage business. We're much more into a business of consolidation. But when you say, wow, let's release a product, the first answer is, where's the product manager? Where's the business case? Where's the money coming from? What's your pricing look like? Is this sustainable in the markets we have? Will this cannibalize other forms of revenue? Where is this business and why? We're now looking for attractive financial returns. You now have to make sure that this thing guarantees 10% return on investment, 20%, whatever your company's margins are, before you even get close to having a product. Investors are no longer gamblers in this industry. People invest in your companies because of reduced investment risk and assured return. They don't want the wild ride anymore. That means innovation goes out the door. That means experimentation is not part of the industry you are working in. That means that when you look at IPv6, it's not a case of, oh, that's cool, let's do it. It's a case of how much will it cost and who's going to pay? And that's the business we're in. So now we're all into bundling. We've been sucked in by the short messaging service in mobile wireless systems that managed to send a short text of 150 characters and charge people 25 cents. What's the megabit rate of SMS? $10,000 a megabyte. What do they want from IP in their wildest fantasies? Let's be generous, $1,000 a megabyte. They're greedy. We're now looking for value add. Everything has to add value to the packet. We're not interested in the crap packets. We're interested in the ones that we can charge more for. We're interested in recreating the telephone system of the 1980s where the cost of the call was irrelevant. What we managed to do then as an industry was charge people for the value of talking, and they paid. We want it back again. So now we're trying to look for where the value add might sit. And the real question is, is it there? Will this work in a conservative model? So let me talk about a few issues around here and try and expose, I think, some of these myths and some of the underlying realities. This is a really lousy system security-wise. And we really don't understand what we're trying to do. The list of questions in security, and there's a few there, are pretty fundamental. When I go to my bank website, is it really my bank's website? When I type in my secrets, who am I exposing my money to? You don't know. When I type it in, is there a virus doing keystroke uh, capture and sending it away, even if I go to my bank, where's my secrets being, being sent to? How can the network protect itself from this kind of abuse and attack? How can users protect themselves? If we truly believe, truly believe that this network is capable of carrying the world's economic communications, the world's business, do you honestly think that this system is good enough in its current form. Of course you don't. All of us understand that this is an incredibly vulnerable system and that trust is an article of faith in no, in more than it is a belief. We can't operate this way anymore. We can't operate global networks where the trust model is random chance where what you're talking to is unknown and unverifiable. It doesn't work. So it's pretty obvious that the industry is now focusing on this. We're trying to grapple with what is vulnerabilities. Why are there so many zombies out there? Why can you talk to some folk in some country and dial a DOS attack? What's going on there? This is no longer just you and I. This is now the public sector itself, the regulators, the governments, trying to say, well, we believe this new economy thing. We're going down this path. But guys, fix it up. Make it work better. Tell you what, we're here to help. And you're now finding a whole bunch of agencies, even in this country, coming in to help. And if they can't help technically, they will help you in a regulatory sense. In fact, they'll probably do both. But be aware that this is no longer a deregulated free-for-all. Nothing could be further from the truth. 
Regulation is a pendulum and it is swinging back. And it is swinging back a long, long way. What we've tried to do is a response based on increasing technology. Bundle things up, put more things into the packet, put more things into the wire, put more things in boxes, negotiate more information. All of this is cost. Now at the same time, there are a whole bunch of you out there making a very decent living from insecurity. Putting features into routers that automatically look for the evil bit in the packets and stomp and destroy them at that instant. Going off to customers like me and you saying, wow, spend more money on this insecurity feature. Do they really want the network to be secure? Or do they prefer the current model where it is insecure? Who's willing to pay for real security? Are users willing to pay the difference? Do they understand what they're buying and can they afford it? The fact that we haven't grappled with security in any meaningful sense for some five years should give you a clue that this is a massive inconsistency. Users want security but aren't we willing to pay for it. And we as an industry are trying to grapple with how to do security on the cheap. And as many security folk would tell you, security and on the cheap are often contradictory terms. I don't see an answer. Let me turn to the NGN and other efforts to try and say that IP over everything is crap. IP is not a panacea. Convergence is something that tele telephone executives mutter to themselves in boardrooms about how the new system means that we can get rid of our very expensive time division switches and now everything over IP is the reality. We're going to do phones over IP, we're going to do television over IP, we're going to do everything over IP. Right? Wrong. TCPIP doesn't do that, and it never will. You can't make the pig dance. You're only going to get muddy, and the pig is going to get mildly amused, nothing more. TCPIP works really well when you've got wired networks and adaptive protocols. If you're trying to do resource management, RSVP style, you're trying to do things that are anti-routing. Routing is not a resource management protocol. TCP is marginal. And if you've been one of those unfortunate people trying to make TCP work fast over a noisy wireless system with a long radius, 3G and similar, then you understand that TCP is actually pretty lousy in trying to do real-time traffic under localised congestion because it backs off and dies. Unless you're willing to over-provision absolutely everywhere. So if you're in a carrier and you hear convergence yet again, everything over IP is viable, quite frankly, it's not true. You're not going to junk your SDH switches, your time division switches today, because they still work. And if you really have critical real time, that's the only way to switch it. So right now, convergence is a myth. What's the model? What are we trying to build with convergence? What you've got are adaptive response networks. The network does not defend itself from overuse in packets. This is not a network that resource allocates. It accepts everything and it allows the end-to-end -end sessions to figure out what fair sharing means. So if you've got an adaptive response network like IP and non-adaptive transport sessions like voice or video, it ain't going to fit. All you really have is a network that can support best effort traffic with cooperative adaptive transport sessions. The pig won't dance. And the only reason why we've had such success in IP is not because we've done a great job with voice. We haven't. We've done a great job with data, and we do. Its greatest leverage is through adaptive applications on a best effort network. Certainly we've had a lot more network. At the start of the 90s, we went down into the fiber optic labs and gave them some key performance indicators. Guys, make it go better. And boy, did they overachieve. Not only did they make it go better, but they made it go better by factors of orders of magnitude of three, 1,000 fold. All of a sudden, submarine international cables that used to support half a gigabyte now support up to 600 gigabytes and getting higher. Dense wave division multiplexing changed the industry fundamentally in the long haul. It changed it so much that that entire industry went into glut. 
there was so much massive supply overhang that the economics disappeared. And at one stage on the transatlantic cables, I, out of my measly wage packet, could afford to buy a 10 gig bearer. And so could you. That was a glut. Complete collapse of the market. So OK, we solved the long haul problem. Boy, did we solve it. So when you eliminate one choke point, up comes another. And the entire thing is now about the last mile access, which is really a terrible piece of economics. Very few industries are prepared to bury their money in the ground for 25 years and get back at most 1%. The only industries that we share this with is probably the water industry and the sewerage industry. We are piping. Live with it. What about the technology side? IPv4, I don't think, was ever meant to last this long. In the original idea, we were just an experiment and the big carrier boys would figure it all out and make OSI work better for us, right? This was not meant to happen this way. But it's happened. IPv4 is the dominant and overwhelming protocol choice for this industry. And now, you and I work through NATs. Overwhelmingly, it's a NAT world. And the contradictions of that are now becoming obvious to the poor old applications folk. Peer-to-peer -peer networking is certainly challenging when you can't talk to me unless I talk to you first. And if we're both behind NATs, we can sit and do this forever and not exchange a single packet. When the NATs fail, everything fails. The services are fragile. And Skype is really the NAT successor of the non-Skype Skype, which was Speak Freely. Speak Freely died because it assumed there were no NATs. My address was my real address and you could talk to me. The twist with Skype is that it's a NAT-based application. What does this mean? We're back into complexity. We're back into cost, because complexity and cost are the same thing. So IPv4 is certainly not an easy thing to work in these days. And if you're writing applications, it's a nightmare. So even with NATs, we're still running through the address space. This won't last forever, because forever is a really, really big term. So what do we do? There is IPv6 out there. And in theory, there's enough address space, 128 bits, to number the grains of sand of 300 million planets the size of the Earth. There is a lot of address space. And certainly, if you're looking beyond the next quarter's financial returns, if you're looking at a long-term industry viewpoint, if you think your company will still be around, then at least you should consider the possibility of what IPv6 might do to you. Now, I'm not saying deploy it. I'm not saying make it into tomorrow's service platform. I think that's very premature and wisely so, but I don't think you should ignore it. IPv6 is not what it was always cracked up to be. It doesn't have better security. It doesn't have better QoS. It doesn't have better anything. It is v4 with bigger addresses. And that's all it is. Now, that might be enough, because when you look at the silicon industry, chips are being manufactured in volume runs of hundreds of millions of units. How many PDAs are going to be manufactured this year? How many hundreds of millions? A lot. All of a sudden, the volume silicon industry is stressing our model. And there's no doubt that IPv6, just with larger addresses, has a better chance of coping with it. But no one wants to pay. Hello, dear customer. You can now use IPv6 as well as IPv4. Please pay me $10 a month more. Why? Because now your mail comes over IPv6. Why? What did it come over before? Well, IPv4, and that was obviously worse. Hello, excuse me. What's the change to me as a customer? Why should I pay you more? I can still surf the web. I can still get email. Why should I pay for your IPv6 deployment? Oh. We don't deploy. There's no economics pushing deployment in the current market. So let's think differently. What kind of market are we talking about when we're talking about IPv6? I don't believe it's packets to eyeballs. I don't believe it's a laptop market. I don't believe it's a high value market. I don't believe that IPv6 has anything to do with value added services at all. It's all about a device-rich world. 
Let's think about a device rich world just for a second. I have IPv6 on an RFID on my luggage tag as it goes through the airline system. How much money will I let my luggage tag spend? Ten dollars? You've got to be joking. Ten cents? Oh, maybe. One cent? Okay, you got me. In a device rich world, the communications industry that supports it has to stop thinking value add, has to stop thinking $10,000 a megabyte and starting to think one ten millionth of a cent a megabyte. The full and really dramatic implication of what the words economy, sorry, commodity and utility really mean to this industry. Because if we're going to do IPv6, you're not going to be living in a company that has gold-plated taps in the bathroom. It's a dramatically different company that works off very slim margins and ships packets simply as packets as cheaply as possible. If IPv6 is going to really cut it in this world today, the price you're going to pay for your monthly access to DSL has to be less than a dollar a month. You can do that, you're in a device rich world. If you can't do that, then I'm afraid it's nat land for you and me. Because IPv6 is going to be all about commodity based communications. Voice over IP, the death knell of the carriers, oh my god, they're doing it for free. It's more than shipping voice, it's a whole lot more. The technology is fantastically good. We're now getting low to sensitive codecs. If we see congestion, we can actually back off the signal rate. There's a huge amount of abundant trunk bandwidth, so you don't need to do QoS in the core. There's these wonderful solutions in Enum that actually map, if you will, IP addresses into real telephone addresses. And there's all kind of intertwining going on in various handheld devices that do all kinds of things. But it's really not the technology. It's actually about the business and the regulatory system. Carriers these days make a huge amount of money from voice. And they're not going to give in to a cannibalistic feeding frenzy without a hell of a fight. The regulatory system in most countries is based around ex-carrier people. The relationship for so many years was so symbiotic that they speak with one voice, and that voice is not voice over IP. There are massive regulatory and business issues that you're going to have to deal with. They're going to cut to the heart of what we thought was telephony and the social contracts that came with it. When everyone wants to use the phone, do phone calls work? When everyone wants to use VoIP, does VoIP work? When everyone wants to use VoIP and BitTorrent and this and that and saturate your local line, what happens then? Who do you call? How do you call them? There's a squeeze play going on and it's a really, really dramatic squeeze play. If you take the traditional ISO 7 layer stack and start these days to put an arbitrary collection of brand names against each role player, then traditionally the carrier owned top to bottom. It was my telephone handset, you were able to use it, and I'm very gracious to allow you to use it, but it was my handset, my local loop, my this, my switch, my everything. I owned you. I charged you whatever I wanted because I was the monopoly and the charging was a social contract. The carrier is now in a squeeze play that's dramatic. Who owns the user's eyeballs? Who really owns the user's eyeballs? Is it Google, Yahoo, eBay, Skype, the overlay networks? who have nothing to do with plumbing. They just smatter it on the top. I believe they do. Who owns the application? Well, by and large, I'd put the brand name of Microsoft there. They own it. Who owns the platform? It's the chip manufacturer. It's Intel and their crew. Who owns the last mile infrastructure? Who built it? Who set the economics? Corning. It's all fiber. And who switches? Cisco, Juniper, and their ilk. So what does the carrier do? Does it define the stack anymore? Of course not. The carrier is being squeezed into a very, very small room, and it's being squeezed into a room that's called commodity. It's a consumer market IP access. There's no value add. It's just small to medium enterprise. And what if you're a struggling reseller, an enterprise ISP? Wow, what a change it's been. You're now the SME service integrator, which is a very, very tiny little job. So now we're in an industry that has massive contradictions. In Australia, one of the industrial giants of that country was a company called BHP. 
It started off being a bunch of farmers running a mine. That didn't work. So they transformed themselves. They became a bunch of miners. But the business transformed itself. BHP was now a steel manufacturer run by miners. Then they became a bunch of steelers running an oil business. We're actually ruled by the last generation in the telephone carrier industry. We're a bunch of telephone folk playing with IP and we just don't get it. Any of you who've been in this business must have heard triple play by now. I want to deliver down the IP wire, voice, video and data all at the same time. Real-time television down the wire. Crap! BitTorrent 1. Get over it. Value-added service networks are historic remnants. The only reason why you're doing it is nostalgia, not reality. Get over it. Overlays are happening at the edge. It's not in the middle. The internet was never about performance and quality. It was about cheap. Remember that and learn from it. QoS in the core, and I would even suggest QoS at the edge, is a losing proposition. Forget it. The internet was never a good time switch. If you really want high quality real time data, and I mean real time, you need high quality real time switching. IP switches are no substitute. And VoIP, despite the fact that it works technically, is a regulatory mess. And it's not going to get any easier in the coming years. It's going to get much, much, much messier. And the convergence message, it used to be everything over, what was it, ATM? Now it's everything over IP is still circling around most boardrooms and most investor level conferences. Get over it. It's never going to happen. IP is not the foundation of high value add networks. It enables high touch overlays, but the network is not value. The network is volume. The silicon industry understood that years and years ago. We haven't yet. We're heading down into that gap of what is a volume based, low value commodity activity. We're heading into the sewerage pipes. Understand it and plan for it. You can't stop it. And stop looking for the killer app. There's nothing left. Everything over HTTP is one. Think about XML, RSS, wikis, blogs, torrents, what users are actually doing. They're already doing it right now. It's happening in overlays. There is no more killer app. It's already there. The network is now service applications sitting on top of XML, sitting on top of HTTP, sitting on top of some muck, whether it's NAT, application level gateways or anything else. That's the application world we are now playing in. So just remember that. The current situation is now client server and that's what we're living with. So what have we learned in amongst all of this? The euphoria of the boom and bust hasn't taught us much, but I think it has taught us a few things if we're careful to look for them. The internet is not the panacea of communications, and it will not be that. Some things can't fly, no matter how much thrust you put into it. Investors at the top in Google are playing a gambling game. High risk, possibly high return. Investors in wires are playing a different game. Low return, low risk. Anyone who tries to be vertical lives with a contradiction between those markets. So now we're finding market specialization. Time Warner wants to get rid of AOL. Why? Think about it for a second and you'll see it's a vertical market problem. They have differing risks and opportunities. We're now looking at specialization in this industry. The idea that Google can reach downwards or AT&T can reinvent itself and reinvent its monopolistic situation is mythology and nostalgia. Neither will really happen. Triple play doesn't work. The internet isn't an entertainment medium. But bloody hell, it's a remarkable exchange medium. eBay works beyond anyone's fantasies because that was its power. And just remember too, that this industry is very, very young. The telephone has now had 129 years to figure it out. We've had about 10. It's very immature and there's much to learn. So what can we expect? The telephone industry has been cannibalized, and that was the first boom. There's now another boom rising. It's the battle for the user. It's between the Yahoo's, eBay's, Rupert Murdoch, advertising revenue. It's the battle for you and your money and the way you spend it. And there's another boom happening in that space. But it's not your boom if you're in the ISP industry, if you're in the underlying sewerage industry. It's someone else's boom. 
Networks are not value add. Value added service providers are looking straight in the eyeballs of Chapter 11. Networks are a commodity utility business with commodity utility returns. The silicon industry made the shift from value to volume. We are painfully learning that lesson right now. So what can I expect? I can expect more surprises from Google, the battle for me and my spending. And so far, they've never failed to amaze me in their short history. Neither has Yahoo, neither has eBay. I'm willing to sell this on eBay next week. I never thought that was possible. And some idiot's willing to pay money for it. Wow. Deregulation is actually a word that has no sense in today's world anymore. The regulatory pendulum is swinging back enormously because communications is a public service. So expect the regulatory pendulum to swing way, way back with massive levels of regulatory interest in everything we do and public objectives being rephrased again. Much, much more restructuring. It may not be a restructure every week in the business you work for, but it'll certainly be one every six months. So get the araldite or the glue together and stick it to your chair and sit down on it hard because the ride is going to be very rocky. The new economy really doesn't exist. It's just the economy, stupid. So when you say it was all wonderful and things were going to change, no, they're not. The new economy is exactly the same as the old economy, which I actually credit to Pete Townsend way, way back at almost the same time the internet started, because who's next with that song on it happened in 1971. And I, at least a little bit older than five years, I really remember it coming out, and I thought it was cool then too. Thank you. We don't have an awful lot of time, but we can probably take a couple of questions if they're quick. Um, first, Jeff, I'd like to thank you for coming to your first Nanog and presenting a talk that uh, really, I think, does something important, raises the, <clears throat> the level of conversation to some meta questions that are really quite important for this industry. Um, I was curious if you could tell me, uh, how does everything over HTTP address the security questions that you listed? I can't answer it. And neither can the users, and neither can the industry. One of these wonderful contradictions we manage to live in. But somehow, some way, users expect more, but still expect everything over HTTP. Think of it as a business opportunity. Are, uh, are IMS and IP sphere tilting at windmills? Yes. Thank you. Okay, that was very quick, so one last one. Uh, Richard Hill from the ITU. For those who don't know me, I've been involved in telecoms for about 35 years in one way or another. I have to say, Jeff, this is probably the first time I agree with everything you said. <laughs> I usually only agree with 90% of what he okay. says. Uh, I'll just give you a couple of, uh, of statistics that I have, uh, which uh, kind of reinforce what Jeff said. As many of you know, the, the mobile telephone industry has had growth which is slightly faster than Internet and has about 50% more users worldwide than Internet. That's the other boom and bust. Went through exactly the same cycle as the Internet. When I left uh, Orange, which is a European uh, mobile operator, four years ago, at the, uh, when they merged or sold telecom uh, GSM operators, they were going for about $10,000 a user. I've been looking in the papers now, they're going for about $1,000 a user. In four years, a factor of 10 loss in, in capital, capitalization. And my favorite scary statistic for those of us in this industry is that in Europe, the average cost of a telephone interconnect is about three euro cents a minute, about three US cents a minute. Well, guess what? The average cost of a kilowatt hour is about the same. How many kilowatt hours in one minute of telephony? Thank you. And one very last question, Paul. Uh, this is not a question. I just wanted to point out to Jeff and the audience that ATM t-shirt is for sale again. We are printing them at ISC. You can visit our website and uh, order them. Oh, thank you for the t-shirt. That was wonderful. <laughs> thank you.